as chair of Badminton Europe's Women in Badminton Working Group. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to be here with you this morning as host of the first Women in Badminton Coaching Conference. Uh, I'd like to first introduce two of my fellow working group members, Ella Deal and Christina Danskin. They'll be helping me out today and uh, Cheryl Evans, who's here in a slightly different capacity. She's also a member of our working group. Um, the issue of promotion of women in sport at all levels has become a prevalent discussion topic and it is one that is very close to my heart. I'm very proud to be here this morning to be able to introduce this coaching conference focusing on the promotion of women and girls in European badminton. Uh, I hope this morning is an opportunity for us all to learn and to create some interesting discussion points about how we can improve the situation in European badminton at this point in time. I'd now like to ask the Acting President of Badminton Europe, Yao Matos, to come forward and officially open the conference. Thank you. And to express to you how seriously uh, Badminton Europe uh, takes the women in sport and the gender equality in our sport. As I think uh, Emma has been working and the working group has been working very hard, we really are lucky to have a sport where we really have gender equality on court even. So it is really important to keep up that. We are ahead on that aspect to some other sports that we compete uh, in the global uh, aspect. But it's not only about the, the, the playing field and how we are perceived as a sport for gender equality. It's also in other aspects, because I just realized, just coming here, because we have our office from Babington Europe here in Copenhagen, and I was just doing my calculation, and we have four men and three women in the office, so we even in the administration, we are taking it very seriously to have the equal opportunities for women and, and men in our sport. So I really have to congratulate our working group that uh, we fortunately set up with, the, with them working very hard to do whatever we can do to really push the, the, the status of the women in our sport. So it is also with the technical officials, is also with the administrators that we have to look in. And we are not bad uh, on that aspect, but we need to improve. So that's why you are all here. Uh, eagerly waiting for the presentations that I'm sure will give us <coughs> many good ideas on how to continue our job to do uh, the good sport that we have and it's not by chance that really we have uh, sport when even in the playing field we are equal standards uh, for men and women because that's why it is such a great sport. Thank you and enjoy the conference. Steve Gunn from Great Britain Rowing. Steve has extensive coaching experience at elite level. He has coached numerous Olympic and world champions, and he was New Zealand's national high performance coach for four years. His current role sees him heading up a GB's Team Start program, which is an innovative program that looks to recruit and develop young rowers to become Olympic medalists. As Steve will tell you, the program has a proven track record with female athletes, and I hope that his presentation today will produce some interesting ideas on the development of women at the athlete and coach levels. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Steve Gunn. I'm going to uh, talk uh, first of all about what we do, and then I'll finish off at the end by uh, giving you some of my thoughts on, on females in sport. Uh, those, I would say straight away, are my opinions, not necessarily the opinions of British rowing. And if anyone wants to ask questions uh, while I'm ranting on, uh, then please do so. Uh, if you want to throw things, then wait till the end. <laughs> okay, so me for a start. Um, originally I was a school teacher um, for a long time. And uh, I taught biology and I was sort of the, the head of the year. Um, and uh, I did school rowing as a volunteer, and then that led me into junior international rowing, um, taking uh, crews to junior world championships. <coughs> Later on, when I, when I started taking teaching more seriously, or I had to take teaching more seriously, I became more pompous. Um, uh, I then stopped doing coaching at school and started coaching international, senior international crews. And in those days, you could be a volunteer coach at, at Olympic level. 
uh, something that you can't really do now. It's getting very difficult to do now. And I, was, I went to three Olympics as a volunteer, um, and that gives you an idea of how old I am. Uh, I've coached my first crew uh, at the, in 1988. It was a women's crew, a women's, women's cox four. Uh, so I've coached both men and women, boys and girls, uh, right the way through my career, uh, which has been uh, good for me. Um, in 1996, after the Atlanta Olympics, it had become really impossible to uh, be a, an international volunteer coach. Um, it was getting more difficult, and uh, so I went to New Zealand and, uh, and, and did four years there. Came back from there and joined British Rowing, uh, coached for I think six or seven years in the team, <coughs> rather than coaching men, actually I was coaching men there, uh, coached in the men's team, and then started this job six years ago, which is where I've been ever since. So, start is a kind of trendy name, um, and 12 years ago, by the way, this will be available for people, so they don't really need to write it down or anything. 12 years ago, we felt that British rowing needed an, an extra source, an outside source of extra athletes to supplement what was already going on. Not to replace clubs or universities or the normal school rowing, but to add people into the system who otherwise wouldn't be there. Um, especially in the disciplines where we weren't so strong. Now the disciplines where we weren't so strong were men's sculling. Rowing has uh, two disciplines. It's got rowing where you have one stick and sculling where you have two. So uh, you don't need to worry about that really. But it's just a, we weren't very good at men's sculling and we weren't very good at women's rowing. We didn't have a big women's team. We hadn't won any of the big medals at that. Uh, no, we won one of the big medal at that stage, but no gold medal. Um, so, after the pilot scheme start, started, or began, I suppose, 11 years ago. Originally, there were three centres, a coach each, about 10 or 20 athletes. Now, it's uh, developed into nine full-time coaches in nine centres around the country. <coughs> there was, we have some satellites where we can't move someone, we find someone we want, we can't move them because they're young, and if there's a coach that will play the game, we run them with a satellite. We have about 95 athletes between the ages of 14 and 24 on the scheme at any one time. Um, so it's reasonably big, I suppose. <coughs> That's what we do, if you can read that. Um, the job description for start is dead easy. We identify, recruit, and develop rowers for the Olympics. We're there to do an extra talent, provide an extra talent stream, and so we recruit non-rowers. We go into schools, wherever, anywhere we can find them really, and we find people who aren't rowers, but look like rowers. What we think rowers look like, what Olympic rowers look like. I'll talk about that in a minute. We also, uh, sometimes we'll, we'll recruit um, rowers who have done a bit of rowing, perhaps they're in a club that's not so good, um, they haven't got the resources to do it, but, we'll, but we try and get people into the Olympics who would not otherwise get there. So we're trying to make the team bigger. Um, to do that, we have to identify what we're looking for. And we write the talent ID test. They need to be robust, repeatable, transportable, because you can't have some amazing lab in the middle of the country where everyone has to, which, which yeah, that's the training thing. Let the scientists loose and they'll, they'll want to poke a prod stab people and all that kind of stuff. We need tests that are really simple to do and repeatable. We can put them in a van and drive them around the country, which is what we do. Um, because we want to test loads of people. We're looking for a needle in a haystack. Okay? In Ryan's case, it's a very big needle, but it's still a needle in a haystack. We've tested in the last uh, 12 years over 40,000 people. And we need to test those numbers to find the right stuff. So it's no good having trendy tests, we've got to have easy ones. And the key thing is if you're doing talent ID tests <coughs> is you need to know what you're looking for. So you've got to identify the key factors in potential for the sport. And that's the key thing for us, and an interesting one for, for a sport like badminton, is it, it's easy to spot someone who's good at the sport if they're doing the sport. Even I could do that. 
it's much more difficult to spot someone who could be good for sports before they've started playing it or when they've just started playing it because people who have just started may not be good but they may have a bigger potential than someone who is good at the moment so that's again I, get, I suspect that's certainly true in a lot of sports that the people who start off really fast really good early on are not necessarily the people who will win you Olympic medals and yet spotting that and explaining it to parents etc 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 is difficult so that's really important for us the test we do We test for height, we test for arm span. Rowers, believe it or not, are longer that way than they are that way. So they have to have long arms. Um, we do a simple strength test. There has to be a strength test that doesn't involve lifting weights, so we use a sort of simple gym machine. Uh, we do an endurance test, and we don't use a rowing machine for this. We actually sit them on a, on a bike, on an exercise bike, which has levers, so they have to use their arms and legs at the same time. Um, because we want to find a, where they've got a natural engine. It's no, use for, it's no use us testing whether they can run or not, because we don't want little runners. If we put them on just an exercise bike, we could be selecting Tyrannosaurus rex, with big legs and little arms. Um, and so we need, we define, this is the best <coughs> test we can do. The key thing is that no prior training is required, because otherwise you'll miss people. You're only relying, if you if it's prior training required, you're only relying on people who happen to live near a rowing club or who happen to go to a school that rows. And of course, most of the population of Great Britain don't do those things. So we're widening our talent pool. We've got two strategies, two basic strategies. Active is where we go to them. That is to say, we go and raid local schools. Um, we just walk, go in there, talk to the teachers. Hopefully we get the big people, sometimes we don't. Uh, we don't always get the big people. We find that the low, the, often if you go to a boys' school, the rugby team happen to be on a practice while we're testing, or the netball team is locked in the toilets or something, that we don't happen to be able to sit, we can't test them. But anyway, we go to them. Local universities, we'll go and do that. Um, Bath University, which is one of our tent centres, they've got a very simple thing there. Every student at Bath has to go through one door in the first three days of each year to get their accommodation sorted out. So we just have a mark on the door, one for men, one for women. Anyone over that mark, the coaches just sit out there for three days and just grab hold of them and say, hey, would you like to cover them? Right. Um, so there's active schemes and there's passive schemes. That's where people come to us, where we sit still and people come to us. That's where we get big campaigns, UK sport, help sometimes. We, we join up with other sports that want tall people, basketball, netball, handball, volleyball. Um, that sometimes works. The problem there is publicity, as it would be, I guess, for your sport. Rowing is not, rowing doesn't get on the television as much as we'd like. Not well, like soccer, anyway, which is on the telly every second. We get local contacts. Because we've been going now for 10 years, 11 years, more and more people in Britain know that rowing has, you know, we exist and that we don't want big people, so people ring us up and say, hey, I've got a big grandchild or I met this big bloke, I've got a big kid in my class, Would you, can, can they come and be tested? Sometimes, we have to get that happening, we test them and, and they're in the wrong sport. We actually, I'll give an example of that, we, we tested a, a man in Wales, three, four, four years ago, four, four years ago. His mum said, I've got this huge boy, 16 year old, he's massive, and he doesn't like rugby, which of course in Wales is a disaster. Um, and we tested him, but he was huge. Um, and he was too big for the boats, we hadn't got a boat big enough for him. He was 135 kilograms. Um, so, and, he, and he was scared of falling in as well. Um, but he, because he was doing some training, uh, he said, why don't you try throwing? You know, try javelin or you know, discus or something like that. And he tried that, he wasn't very good at that either. But he still came on training and they suddenly noticed he's actually quite good at weightlifting. And he's now a British junior weightlifting champion, he got a bronze medal at the European uh, championships and he's got both British records for snap and uh, So some, if, some, sometimes these tests are odd results, we pass people on. Um, and sometimes people ring us up 
that would just say, hey, I'll be big and test me, <laughs> um, which is great. Um, the active testing where we go to schools, that sounds really, really easy, but it's actually very hard. If you've got to go around 30 schools in your area, that's, that's very, very difficult. Very time consuming, needs a lot of effort. Um, cycling did this for three or four years in the early two, 2000s because they had very low numbers. They've stopped doing it now because they've got so much publicity for the success of cycling that they deliberately stopped it and said, we, we, we don't need to do it anymore. With rowing, we don't think we could do that. The problem with that, of course, is you've got a, and you've also got a limited genetic pool. You're only testing around your own centres. So we only test around the centres we've got. The passive testing, if you can get the publicity, is much better because people come to you, you're, sele you're selecting from the whole population, and uh, it's much better. The problem is getting the publicity and what you do with them when we find them. Because we get people from, we found people in the middle of Wales, live on a farm or something. There's no rowing club anywhere near them. So we have to relocate them. And to say to someone who's never rowed before, hey, how do you fancy giving up your job, giving up whatever you're doing, moving to this place and learning a new sport, because we think you could be good, is quite a challenge. And yet we do get people to do it. And we've had some success doing that. But it's not, that's not for everybody. Um, we've got one, one college we work with, we'll take 60 year olds doing that. Um, and again, that's a big challenge for some people. We, we're very careful how we do that. Uh, an example of a big campaign, uh, in, in uh, 2009 we ran a thing called Tall and Talented. This is because they have to have trendy names like Fish and Chips or something like that. Uh, it was one with, run with basketball. We did get publicity because we were working with UK Sport. And they got enough clout to be able to get out various ways. Um, so we did it online. So there were 1,500 sign-ups nationwide. Uh, that's an example of the sort of thing we, te we uh, take. Um, we tested 900 people in January 2010, over seven days in five locations. That's pretty intensive, but it's quite a good way of doing it. Two months later, we tested, we had a phase two, we got the best 100, and we tested them again, did a bit more work with them. And, and then over the next six months, as we could find them and sort them out and work with them and decide what was best for them and work with them, about 44 joined start. So far, of this lot, we have one senior international and one under 23 international. In, what is it, four years, three years. So that's the kind of thing, that's an example of how we do it. If you look at these, the people in this shot, this guy, who is six foot ten, um, didn't make it. He's just given up. Uh, this one here, she she did. She's an example. She's uh, she's actually at 16. She comes from Cornwall, which doesn't have a great deal of rowing. She moved at age 16 to a to a college, um, did her A levels there, is now at the university, still rowing, still looking pretty promising. Uh, this is the kind of thing we do. This is the strength testing. Uh, this is just going to be being tested. We try and do a physio screen, so we see whether they balance, um, see whether they do simple things, um, just work with them, just kind of get a, a profile. So we, we try and make sure we're getting the right sort of person. We even talk to them to see whether they've got a brain or not, whether they want to do stuff. Uh, work their lifestyle through with them. Get them to talk to each other. I have a question. Yeah. Um, when you do those tests, are there more men? Or more feeble? Or is ah, it feeble? yes, that, that's very good. Good question. But this test, this tall and talented test, yeah. we had about four men for every one female turning up. Okay. About four men. At the, of the 44 that we took at the end, it was, we take 50-50. We try and keep the ratio the same. But in terms of people putting themselves forward, four to one. I'll come back. I'll come back to that in a minute. We've, we've had hopefully some interesting stuff. Um, we try and see where they look as though they might be able to row. We even put them in a boat. That's that's people on their first ever rowing outing. Because we want to know whether they're whether they're going to whether they're going to be able to take risks, where they're interested in taking risks. And we try and keep it sort of light-hearted. And you can see it doesn't always work. <laughs> 
Um, and we want to know whether they mind falling in, because that's a key thing. It's like, it's like you can't learn to ski without falling over, and you can't learn to row without getting wet. So we need to know well, straight away whether someone's prepared to take the risk of learning a new sport. We do this thing called confirmation. That's a kind of trendy word. So are we right for them, are they right for us? So there's a probation period. When we've tested someone, if they've got the right scores, we kind of look at them for between one and six months and see whether it's okay rather, because we, what I don't want to do, especially with juniors, say, hey, you can go to the Olympics, three months later, say, no, you're not. Because that's, that's irresponsible of us, we try not to do it. Um, so we work with people generally before we take them off and try and keep it low key. So if someone doesn't like it, they just walk away. They don't have to, you know, it's not a kind of, oh, I've just been ch chucked off a national program. Because that's, that's quite bad, I think. For the youngsters. Now, the other thing Start does, apart from running around finding monsters, is we have a view of development, and this is this may be a bit more relevant for, for, for you guys. And the key to it is the concept of a high performance novice. That sounds really weird, doesn't it? A high performance novice. High performance novices are exceptionally good at some things, but average at the other ones. And that's the key thing. They're exceptionally good at the things we think are important, but they might be utterly useless at something else. And the big difference, the big difference gives you an unbalanced athlete. And unbalanced athletes don't necessarily make quick progress. Medium people, medium sized people, people who are reasonable at everything, <coughs> will often progress much quicker in a sport. But, are they going to get right to the top? So, in terms of development, if you're going to do this properly, high level pressure development has to happen right from recruitment to maximise the chance of success of long successful long term development. If you don't do that, you get full. We selected uh, 10 years ago now, one of the, our earliest recruits was a boy um, who was uh, the right height, but he was 125 kilograms. He was fat. Um, and when he came down to the Rowing Club and started coaching with his star coach, he got a lot, there was quite a lot of you know, body selecting kids like that for the rowers don't look like that. But actually, over the next four or five years, he lost weight, and he found underneath the uh, camouflage, there was actually a very strong, powerful athlete, as showed up on our tests. And now he's in the senior team, he's actually in the double skull. Competed in the last Olympics, and he's still competing for Britain. So, by identifying what we want, rather than what we don't want, if you see what I mean, then if he'd gone to his normal Ryan club and just joined, he'd have never gone anywhere, because they've got the other. He's too fat, he's never been in the boats. You can't, get, you can't actually get to forward, um, etc. So that's a, and there's lots of examples of that sort of thing. So getting these right right from the start, identifying what you want then developing it is really important. And the quality of coaching, I'm afraid, is crucial. The co coaches have to be sympathetic with problems and get, taking someone from zero to Olympics is very challenging. Um, and being patient and doing the right things is very challenging. Good coaches are absolutely crucial to what we do, and I suspect are absolutely crucial to every single sport. If you look at a centre, you know, sometimes if you look around the world at your sport, or any sport, you'll find there's a funny, you know, there's some little town in the middle of Russia that has generated all the, all the world championship hammer throwers. That's not a coincidence, that's the fact that there's some weird old coach who's been there for 500 years, who is really good at hammer, coach, hammer throwing. And so, so coaches are absolutely vital. You guys at the back may not understand, might not appreciate that, or admit it, but they are. I'm afraid to say that. Now, I've, I've left this slide in because it's it's about rowing, but I suspect it's about any sort. But it's why don't people row well? Most people row pretty badly. In fact, most people do most sports pretty badly. If you look at it, if you actually analyse their team, they're like, why do people do it like that? 
And the key thing in any sport is you start off with your abilities and your skill sets. Coaching sorts those out into your sport technique. And then training gives you a functional, makes that technique functional to play the game. Too often, in most people who play sports, you don't go through this process. You go from back here somewhere, straight down there. And you never actually learn to play a sport properly. In rowing, that's crucial because if you don't play the sport properly, well, no, it's not crucial. If you don't play the sport properly, you're just bad at it, I suppose. In rowing, also, you can get injured. And I think in most sports, you can get injured as well if you don't do things properly. But that's the problem. By not going through this process, by, by thinking you can take shortcuts, you limit the headroom on the athlete and you may produce injuries. And the fact is, we certainly say it in rowing, and I suspect it's true in badminton. Nobody walks through the door looking like, actually, no one walks into a rowing club and is an Olympic rower. In the same way I suspect no one walks into a club and is a, is a perfect badminton player. So if they start playing the sport straight away and really do it like that, then they're probably going to do something wrong. And if you do something wrong at the start, it's very difficult to change it later. Unless you've got one of those men in black pens that erase your memory. Which I wish I had when I put all the athletes on. So it's important to deal with try and deal with each stress room balance and develop good technique before poor, poor movement patterns cause limited form to that really. Um, and that kind of you know, causes failure. And before technique, you've got to do these sort of things. Because technique, if you like, if you think about technique as you're building a statue. These things are the little Lego land bricks that make the statue. And if these things aren't right, it doesn't matter how hard, how what a fantastic coach you are, how much you talk about what, what fantastic bit of technique you need there. If someone's got tight hamstrings, rubbish hip flexors, poor glutes, no lower trap stability, you could coach them as much as you like and they won't you won't get your statue because the brick's wrong. You're, that can stick. So it's really important that you build the bricks before you try and create your sculpture. How do we do that? Well, we do confidence drills, agility, core flexibility, weights, all that kind of stuff. What we don't do is run. What start doesn't do is very much rowing at all. When, we, when they learn. We do not use rowing as a form of training until technique has been developed, which means until you've solved all the other problems. Because someone who can't do a one-legged squat, who can't balance, who can't set their shoulders, will row back. And if that's the case, then straight away you've limited what they do. So we don't use, we train, they, they train hard, but it won't be right. They might sit in a boat going nowhere, practicing a particular drill for an hour, and then go off for a run, or swim, or cycle, or anything that isn't right. <coughs> and that is a big leap of faith. That's, that's where our coaches differ from the average coaches. Because most people think, oh, you've got to go right. So you take ten, you do a bit of technique, and then you go and row up the river and back. Now, if it takes, this is a kind of generalisation, but someone's probably written it in the book. It takes about ten thousand repetitions to get something really grooved in. Now, ten thousand repetitions sounds like a horrendous number, and if you're taking ten thousand practice rowing strokes one at a time, it does take quite a long time. But if you're rowing, okay, if you're rowing up the river and back in, it's only about 100 kilometres. And 100 kilometres is only about a week or two's training if you're actually rowing. 
So if you do something wrong, two weeks later, that's stuck. And getting it out again is really difficult. You've got to do 10,000 single repetitions. I suspect the thing same in, in badminton, the, the, tr the truth would be there. Practicing or serve 10,000 times might be quite tedious. But if you play loads of matches, how many serves you have you served? And it soon adds up, and all of a sudden, whatever it was you did wrong, is grooved in. That's the way you do it, and that's the way you do it forever. Because once you've learned something, trying to unlearn it is very difficult. Even your coach has a baseball bat. The challenges on doing that approach are well, your coach has got a baseball bat. <laughs> The challenge is motivation, because obviously, if you're teaching kids to do this, it's very easy when we get bored. You've got to do enough to make it interesting, and it needs to be individualised, because different people will, will go, will go different, at different speeds. And if you hold someone back, that's as bad as promoting someone beyond their means. And that's a big challenge, that's coaches have to work really hard. And athletes need to not do the same thing. Um, fast track. I, we, I often get accused of running a fast track program. I hate the word fast track. Fast track implies shortcuts and the wrong thing. What you can do is stuff right, in which case you might be a bit quicker than someone who's doing it wrong, but that's not fast track. And the temptation to accelerate into performance too early is enormous. From the athletes themselves who want to go out and race and do stuff, from coaches, from senior coaches. I'll get senior coaches going, oh, there's a really big kid, he's got a good score, he's big, big and strong, let's have him, let's, let's make him do this. And that's really bad. So we actually fight off senior coaches sometimes, saying someone's not ready to do, to do all the training and all the stuff that you want them to do for another year or two before they do it. So, that temptation to go for performance too early is difficult. Uh, the way style works, the investment, all this kind of stuff we do to them, all we give them is coaching, we don't give them money. Even if they're moving, we don't give them money. The only money they get is when they're good enough to get money by the normal routes. Um, so any, any money I've got goes into coaching, goes into employing coaching, into educating them, into backing them up with stuff. That, that's all. <coughs> uh, and that brings me on coaches. I've already mentioned those. There's one of my coaches there, improvising with his athletes. Um, it's, it's a specialised task. And coaches who do this need to rec be rec recognised and be recognised for it. They need to be inducted and supported. Because if you're going to do this stuff, and you're going to get your athlete to practice whatever weird skill it is you want to do, instead of whacking shuttlecocks around the place, then you've got to have the confidence to do that, while the other club coach is going, what are you doing? Why don't you come play a game? In start, we have, there's nine coaches, so there's ten of us, um, and it's really important that we have collegiality, that is we chat to each other, we work with each other, we challenge each other, we give, so if I've got a task, if I've got something I think works, I won't tell people exactly you've got to do this, this, and this. I'll say, well, I think this works, and they'll go and experiment, and they'll come back and tell each other how it's done. And it's important for me to, have, to be to lead and to innovate rather than to manage. Although I'm called, called a manager, I hate the word manager. Um, and that's really trendy nowadays to have systems. So everyone does this, and everyone's got and you've got these numbers and all that kind of stuff. Whereas actually, your leadership and people doing their own thing <coughs> up to a point working stuff out. Does it work? Well, in 2008, start began, what, six years before this, in 2008 we had three female athletes going to the Olympics, they won two medals. 2012, there were 13 star athletes in the British team, five males, who won one gold and bronze, eight females, who won four of whom won gold medals. And 24 of the athletes have gone through start have got to senior level. <coughs> so I suppose it does. That's probably our best example of success. These two won Team GB's first gold medal, not just Ryan gold medal, they won the first gold medal of the Games for Britain. They're both start athletes, which is 
good thing for us. We did get a good publicity thing out of that. This one started around four and a half years before she won a gold medal. Up to that time, but before then, she was a national standard cross country runner at junior level and had played uh, provincial level hockey. This one is, is in the army, just very tough. Um, <laughs> so, if you like, that's the ultimate. For us, that's been great, fantastic publicity, justifies my salary, probably gets us funded for another four years, etc., etc., etc. So, what do we? What else? About, what else is that? That's that's start. So we think start works, and it works for females. That's the key thing. Now I'll come, I'll come on to why it works for females. Hopefully in a bit. In British rowing, just looking at a general snapshot of British rowing, that's the whole <coughs> British rowing. There are 32,000 registered rowers. Other people row as well, but they uh, they've, they've sneaked around paying their fees, so we don't know quite who they are. 42% of those are females, which is quite good. I mean, that's, that's reasonable. I mean, that's enormous. That's changed enormously. If you go over the last 20 years, that's, that's, that's changed quite radically. Since the Olympics, 48% of the new registration has been females. So the Olympics, all of a sudden, has changed the ratio of people joining Brian clubs with internet. The really well. I mean, you probably don't need to be a genius to work that out. Ryan won its first gold, gold medals for Ryan. Women won their first gold medals in Ryan at the Olympics. We won three gold medals in pretty quick succession. Um, with girls, Ryan, sorry, who were all pretty personal people. They, you know, they weren't fat or with bread or anything like that. Um, so they look, they look nice, talk nice. You, know, you could be one of them. Um, and interestingly enough for us, and probably for you guys, 78% of those new registrations were under 23 and 50% were under 18. So it definitely inspired youth to, to join up. So that's it. However, lest we be thought to be marvellous, although the participation numbers appear good, that is, we're nearly 50-50, Far too few females turn up at the trials, at national standard trials. At all levels, senior, under 23, junior. The numbers of men turning up for trials, again, probably is going back to the 4 to 1 ratio. So, and if you think about it, without start, start was providing just under half of the women's team. Four women's teams, well, there were 18 women at the, at the, in the Olympic team. Eight of them were from start. So without the specialised recruitment and, de and development, <coughs> the, the women's team would have been half the size. And wouldn't have won, well, it might have won one goal, but uh, it would have been difficult. So, while it sounds like we're okay in terms of participation numbers of nearly 50-50, at the top level, at the level which matters to me, it's not cool. It doesn't, it doesn't quite work. Girls, women, don't see, unless they're in a specialised programme, to put themselves forward to get to the top in the same way as men do. We look at women in coaching, Actually, before we, go, before we look at women in coaching, go back to that. The 4 to 1 ratio thing also changed for start off the Olympics. We had a uh, recruitment campaign straight after the Olympics, which was actually forced on us rather than people signed up. We had a thousand sign ups after the Olympics online without asking because of the publicity and presumably because of that. We held uh, a, 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 our own. National, national testing, the ratio, instead of being 4 to 1, was 3 to 2. So more than twice the number of women, females, came forward to be tested as you at the uh, bear with Norman. So the role model thing is really important. The role model, 
thing is definitely important. Now, engineering a role model thing is more difficult because we were lucky. We could have asked, I could have asked for better publicity than those two, two, two girls. If I'd written the script myself, I, could, I couldn't have done it better. But the whole publicity role model thing is crucial in giving girls the confidence to come forward. And I'll turn to that level. Women in coaching in Britain, this is British Brian. Uh, this is only a rough card sketch. It's, it's not so hot, but we like, to, you know, we like to think we're an equal sport. But that's men. Us men like to think that we're equal. We're, yeah, oh yes, we 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 look after women properly. Um, but if you look at the management head coaching side of things, there's one female and five males. Frontline <coughs> coaches, that's sort of international coaching for ones. There's one female, eleven males. And in the development, professional development, professionalised development coaches, there are nine females and 19 males. So it's only at the development level where we're starting to get some sort of parity. So it's not, I, wouldn't, I would not claim that British Rhyme is some hotbed of gender equality. And I think that's really important. In start, uh, I have, out of the nine coaches at the moment, two of them are females. That's actually dropped, we were 50 50 uh, three years ago. Um, but that's, uh, we've lost some uh, and we've not been able to find adequate female replacements. So, on to my thoughts. This is where you're allowed to, well, you probably start throwing things now. So, are women different? Now, straight away, I thought I'd put it in the title. I'll just give you a clue. Why have I written our women different? Why have I said our men different? Because straight away I've implied that men are the normal and women are different. I'm going to start throwing something too. <laughs> <laughs> well, but it's true. It, 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 that's without thinking I've done that. You can turn around just to do it and say why are men different? Or are men different? Now, to me, and this is a personal thought, but it's not personal. This is a, this is a non politically correct view with some evidence, a reasonable amount of evidence to back it up. Intellectually, in terms of intellectual thinking, reasoning, intelligence, all those kind of things, women are exactly the same as men. There's no difference at all with their intellectual capacity, their ability to reason stuff out, all those kind of things. Anatomically, that's the same. Women's frontal lobes are just as developed as men's are, and they're not really very different at all. However, women's brains are not the same. Anatomically, if you take people's brains to bits, you can tell a female brain from a male. So it's not true, anybody, in the same way you take their skeleton to bits and, 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 and tell the difference. It's not, it's, it's not true that everyone's the same. They're not. The key thing there is that instinctively and emotionally, males and females react differently. Probably 90% of males and 90% of females react differently from each other to the same stimulus. The easiest model to use for this, for me, and it's not everyone's cup of tea, is Dr. Stephen Peters' chimp model. I'm not going to post a talk you are afraid. If you want to know about it, it's, it's a book. He's written a book called The Chimp Paradox. He's the psychiatrist. He's a, in a former life, he was a forensic psychiatrist. So he used to deal in murderers and serial killers. Um, and he's the guy who's been working with British psychology. He's uh, an interesting speaker um, and uh, quite a powerful man. But he's a neurosurgeon and a psychiatrist, so he's not just cooking stuff up out of thin air. Uh, but if you want to read the book, The Chimp Paradox, it's, it's well worth a read. And the theory goes that basically there's two of them. There's you and your chimp. You are your thinking, reasoning self. Your chimp is your primitive self. And while you yourself are individual, male and female are the same, the chimps are not because 
evolution, in evolutionary terms, we all started off running around climbing trees and stuff, and inevitably females and females and male chimps were different. So the reactions to stimuli on an emotional level tend to be somewhat different, and those are built in. It doesn't mean they're wrong, it just means they're there. So, in about 9 out of 10 females, they'll invest more in group dynamics and structures. So, a group of girls will tend to invest, not deliberately, but underneath it, much more in the social group, in who's the leader and who's not. What's the pecking order? Who's better than who? Not in terms of who plays badminton better or who rows better, but who is the leader. And God help you in a rowing crew if the leader is the worst rower. And that does that be really quite damaging. But that, compared with boys, that's that's quite a small difference. Boys will tend to have a leader and everyone else just flat and squabbling and fighting amongst themselves. The girls will tend to invest in this group dynamics. And given half a chance, that could include the coach. Could include the coach. Females generally are less secure, more neurotic, I don't mean neurotic in an insulting sense, I'll explain that, and need more reassurance. So, if you're talking to a bunch of Boys, and you go blur to one bloke and blur to one, and you don't say them to the other one, they don't care, they just wander off and get over their stuff, picking their nose or whatever they do. <laughs> but in girls' terms, the one you didn't talk to will take the thing, why don't you talk to me? <coughs> so, the way we react to each other is different. It's not wrong, it's just different. Girls often have less self-esteem, lower self-confidence, <coughs> and what self-confidence has can often be brittle. What do I mean by that? Well, they have to go back to your four-to-one ratio of people turning up to be tested. We give everyone who turns up to be tested, when we do these big talent searches, we give them all questionnaires, get them to fill in. What are you hoping to achieve today? What do you think you're doing? Etc. 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 The boys. 90% of the boys will write down, it is 90% of the boys, give or take, percent, will write down, I'm going to the Olympics. There may be no evidence to suggest they're going to the Olympics. There may be quite strong evidence to the contrary. <coughs> but they're all convinced, even this, you know, you get a person who's not even the right size, who's about as strong as a not very strong thing, yeah, I'll go to the Olympics. 90% of the girls, probably even more than 90% of the girls, saying, I'm, I'm just. I just want to see how well, you know, what it's like. And that's on a blind questionnaire. No, no names, no. And that's that's a, we've got a big enough sample. And that's that's true. You, know, you can look at there's plenty of literature to suggest that. It doesn't mean to say there's anything wrong, but it just it, the approach is different. Boys always believe that they can do everything. And Given a setback, most boys will go away and train harder because it wasn't their fault, it was someone else's fault. You know, it's the coach's fault, it's the weather, it's my shoelaces, it's my, it's my mom, it's my dad, it's whatever, it's not me, I just need to train them. A girl in the same situation may well think I'm not good enough. And again, it's not wrong, it's just what happens. The reaction of the boy can be as useless as the reaction of the girl. And girls often don't react positively to direct challenges. So, if you go up to a boy and go, you know, boys will generally tend to turn most things into competitions. Okay, if you go, go and do this, it'll be a competition to see who do the best. Whereas girls often don't, some will, but often they don't, like that. They don't like that kind of, I'm like, who's better than who? They don't like the coach going, me too, this kind of stuff. 
because it doesn't actually correspond with the way they emotionally react. On a, on a rational level, fine, they can work that out, but on an emotional level, you can't. And unfortunately, chimps are a lot stronger than humans and are a lot quicker than humans. So if you stimulate your chimp in the wrong way, <coughs> the chimp gets hold of you and reacts in a way. And once the chimps talk, by the way, chimps don't speak English and they don't talk English and they don't understand English either. So once you're in chimp mode, if your chimps take over, some of you will recognise this. You talk rubbish <coughs> and you don't understand anything that anyone's talking and saying to you because you're reacting to emotions. I hate you. You don't love me. I can't do anything. Right? All those statements are nonsense. Probably. And that's not you talking, it's not your rational self talking. That's your chip. So, what do we do about all this thing? Oh, this is that, that bit there, was, that's about a, a five day lecture to approach you. Compressed into ten minutes. Five minutes, sorry, I'm going to run. Um, right, so, recruiting females. Getting them to have a go is a real problem. Because we already said they won't, they won't tend to. You say, who wants to go to the Olympics? So getting to have a go is a real challenge. If you want to recruit people, how are you going to recruit females? Because it's not with boys, it's easy. Are you tough enough? Yeah. Are you better than everyone else? I'll beat people up, kick sand in people's faces. Whack a thing harder than someone else can do. <coughs> that usually doesn't work with girls. So you might want to do put down the weights. Or in something that's really good, where there's loads of people to talk to. Have a nice time. I don't mean that in a soft way. But getting girls in is actually difficult because they tend not to push themselves forward. Role models are really important. If you can get role models involved, that's really, really crucial. So if you're trying to recruit, you know, if you're going to get girls to play badminton schools, get a badminton player in there. Even if it's an old girl, you know, it's, it's someone who's just left the school or something like that, all those kind of things where you can get people to say, hey, I can do that. Because that takes the, I'm not sure I can. Here's someone who has them. And they're real, they're normal. And up comes some, some kind of weirdo who lives on Mars. You need to provide a safe environment. I don't mean there are weirdos in wrong coats. Going around, going, you know, it needs to be somewhere where they're not threatened if you're trying to recruit. Girls like to know what's going on. Okay? Because they're more worried about stuff, Boys, is a coaching point here, if you're a coacher and, and you coach boys, you can turn up in the morning and go, right, we're going to do this, 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 this. And the next day, oh yeah, we're going to do this, this, this. Girls want to know what's going on today, tomorrow, the next day, the day after that, the week after that, they want to see the whole thing laid out. Boys are too stupid to work out, they don't even know tomorrow exists. <laughs> and that's, sorry boys. <laughs> And that, that's as bad as, the, the two, there's no right or wrong there, it's different. The fact that girls want to know exactly what's happening for the next month and might get a bit upset if it changes is as bad as the boys not understanding that there's a whole plan <coughs> in the month and they need to plan ahead. But they, they, the, the things are there and if we don't understand them, we don't react to them, then it's bad. So you have to have this kind of safe moment where they know what's going on. What are you going to do? What's going to happen to me? If, you if you're recruiting, I've already said, groups are really good. Girls are much better recruiting in groups. And much better, all that kind of stuff. Generally, we test girls separately from boys. If we're going to test at, at the bottom end, once they're in, it it's not so important. I'll come back to why. <coughs> but, but if you're going to test people, girls don't like boys leering at them generally, well not at the start anyway, um, and, and don't, whereas boys will tend to, you know, oh yeah I'm better than you kind of thing straight away, even if they don't know the bloke, they kind of want to compete.
keep them straight away. Girls generally aren't like that. So we often will try and test girls separately from boys. And here's, this is something I think, the more I think about it, this is really quite important. Girls react much better to individual achievement compared with competition. So, and that's the way start works. When we, once we've got people in start, we test them fairly regularly. They all get together, all 90 athletes, got together seven times a year, and they're tested. But they're tested against criteria, they have to go a certain speed in their boats, in their singles, and they're tested for skills. Not against each other, they're tested against, against a set of criteria. If they, get the, if they get the scores, they move up a group, they get promoted, you go five groups A, B, C, D, and E, because we're really right about naming things. Um, and so that take, it does, it, then it doesn't matter, you can test boys and girls in the same environment there, because they're not in a competition, they're actually saying, am I, <coughs> do I fulfill these criteria, if I do that, I move up. Boys are more interested in who's, who's better than who. And that individual achievement, rather than competition, is something I think that's quite important. And the last thing is, recognise the common physical needs and, and understand what's important, because because girls are different from boys, you may get people walking through the door who are actually what you want, but physically they aren't quite right. And crucially, no. crucially, that means things like upper body strength coordination. And that's important for Ryan, and I suspect it's really important for badminton. Because on a rough line of things, girls are about 75% as strong as boys from there down. From there up, it's about 50%. And if you're going to play the sport, you need to get this developed enough to allow you to play the sport. So someone who actually would like or might be a good family player because they're physically not strong enough up here, until you develop them to be physically strong enough up there, you won't know whether they're any good at the sport. And so we, in Sal, we have to take a punt on it. We have to guess, well, could we build some stuff on there? And, and see how it works. But that, recognising what you're actually after when you're recruiting, is really important because it might not be what's in front of you. And that's more true of boys of girls than boys. Boys tend to come with more rounded physical specimens, whereas girls tend not to. And why is that? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, so let me let me go. Let me do this, then I'll come back to it. <coughs> so what I'll do is move upper body strength. So I've just mentioned that, um, and that leads to core and spinal challenges. Because if you are, if you're compared with a boy, a girl is much stronger down here than they are up here. And that means in any action, this comes under much more pressure. Because you're delivering, if you've got delivering much more power, a girl is actually delivering 50% more power in their lower body. To their, through their spine than a boy is, if that makes any sense. So if that's not developed properly, then that can lead to injury and it can lead to lack of development. And core-wise, that's this bit in the middle, I'm sure you, you, know, you guys at the back and people ranting about the core, if you haven't, then you should be. Um, this bit of core, if this isn't developed, then again, every time you do something, even if you're running, a girl running is actually doing more damage to her spine than a boy because the boy has much more strength up here and is able to transmit the force through that. Now, if we ignore that, if we don't develop that properly, then well, we don't try and develop it properly, then we A, might pick the wrong people, B, might not develop people properly, and C, as I say, you might get someone, like, oh, what's a good, what's a bad bit of look tall, long arms, like them? It's good at the balance, I suppose. But I mean, whatever it is you do, you've identified, you've got to look at what's important and what's not. 
And if something's important and something else is missing, well, do you go, well, tough luck, or do you try and develop the bit that's missing? Conditioning is something that's really important. So conditioning is this idea that you don't need to lift weights to get your muscles to that. You need continuous movement, you need, uh, you need really good, accurate movement and, and really good conditioning to get the, all the muscles working so you've got a coordinated movement. And the other problem that girls have, and I'm not sure if this is true in all nations, but it's certainly true in Britain, is girls' sport in schools is not very explosive. Right? It's getting better. Well, no, it's not getting better because girls' sport in schools is generally going down the tubes. But the boys tend to do explosive things. Girls don't. They don't get pushed to be explosive, dynamic, and jump and run and sprint and all those kind of things. Unless you happen to be in athletics or something of that sort. And, and again, if you're playing an explosive sport, and badminton surely is an explosive sport, then how do you know whether someone can do that if they've never done it before? In rowing, we have the problem that a lot of the girls we pick, thinking what we're looking for, you know, someone up here, a lot of the girls we pick, <coughs> if they've played sport at school, they've been netballers. And if they've been netballers, they've been goal shooters or goal keepers. So their actual physical activity involved doing that for long periods of time. So we don't know whether they've got an engine or not because they've never been trained. So we have to look at the shape, look at what might be underneath, and then decide whether they can actually do that sort of stuff. And for you guys, the same might be true. It's sort of, if you look at girls, a girl, a girl who's never done anything explosive, well, can they be? Is it just they've never done anything if they can't, or it's there but it's never been used? I don't know. And we'll go back to oh yeah. female. So that's recruiting females. Female athletes. <coughs> key thing for female athletes: relationship with coaches. I'll put coaches. There might be more than one. Coaches have to be aware, and in an ideal world, the female athletes are aware as well, that females don't react to the same stuff as men do. Now that seems to be blindingly obvious, but I'm afraid to say that quite a large number of coaches, and I'm sure they're in this room, seem to have missed that fact. And the reaction to coaching is, is linked to that. So, as we said, the danger for a coach and an athlete is that, with, that girls, girls' groups, will tend to suck the, athlete, the coach into their group dynamics, especially if it's a female coach. So they become one of the people with whom they're interacting. You get too close to the athletes. And also, that because of the way females tend to react to stuff, they can be, they're much more likely to be achieving to please the coach rather than achieving for their own worth. And that, for coaches, is very flattering, but it's also quite, well, in some cases dangerous, and often destructive, because a change of coach can be much more difficult for a girl than for a boy. Boys don't care, they're obviously sort of shouting at them, that's all right. But if a girl's got their coach in their little social structure, and then someone comes and says, oh, let's change your coach now, and move on, that can really blow stuff out of the water. Not because it's wrong, because it, because that's what happens. And if we don't if we don't re re realise that, and coaches are you know, coaches are, can be so flattered by this. Oh yes, they're my girls and this kind of stuff. And it can be it's really you know, well, whatever. I'll leave you. I'll leave you to work out. What you want. Reaction coaching, same thing. Male coaches shouting at female athletes is probably. Well, no, I'm not saying there's never an appropriate time for it, but you need to think carefully before you do it. Because you might be sending out exactly what you're saying and what they're hearing might be two completely different things. Totally different things. You can shout the same thing as a boy at a boy and they'd be fine. If you, yeah, I'll, yours, mate, I'll show you. Whether you just give it a lot to the girl. Up. Blow to her self-esteem, 
which could well limit their development forever. So that reaction to coaching is really important. Reaction to challenging failure, I think I've probably covered that already. That's something that's absolutely crucial. It doesn't mean you have to be nice to them. I, I hate that idea. When I started first coaching women, they said, oh, you've got a box of tissues with you, have you? you know, it's like, that's not, that's, that is, that's not the case. It doesn't mean you have to be soft or pathetic or, you know, whatever. It's just that you need to be aware of it. And crucially, for female athletes, this is a question <coughs> which, which comes up in the subconscious more often than it does for boys. What will other people think of me? Rather than what I think of myself. All right. I'm doing with this. What are other people? What are other people going to think if I do this? And if you start thinking like that, that's a real nasty loop, especially the day before a competition. More on female athletes. Um, group dynamics, we've already talked about. Pecking orders, selection, deselection. That's really crucial. If you're the coach, you're going to say, oh, well, here's the, here's the team going somewhere. She's got in and you're out. Again, that might take a bit more preparation than if it's a boys to a bit more support, a bit more for everyone involved. The new girl as well as the girls already in the team. As well as the girl you drop. The girl, supporting the girl who's dropped all this. Supporting the girl who's got in, who's perhaps not so obvious. Male and female coaches are returned to the athlete. And the learning to be aggressive and assertive is something that female athletes sometimes actually need to do. Because in evolutionary terms, <coughs> males, okay, patrol the boundaries, bite off the opposition, all that kind of stuff, defend the territory. Females, in evolutionary terms, if they do that, just get killed because they're small. So, females' aggression and assertiveness tends to be more internal within the group. I'm sure those of you have been catty or nasty to anybody, but that is more that than outward kind of, yeah, I'm going to beat you. And so this is actually a behaviour that needs to be, in some cases, quite often, learnt, rather than it's just natural. Males tend to do it naturally. Females often do not. Done physical. Moving on to female coaches. The female coaches are just as female as female athletes, and we need to understand that. So they may need support to surround their coaching. So intellectually, a female coach is just as good as a male coach. But they may need support because emotionally they will react to failure or challenges in a different way from male, male coaches. And it's very easy to not understand that. Female coaches may not apparently do well in male dominated groups of coaches unless the environment is good. And the trouble is, in most sports, virtually all sports, I would say. Men were there first, not because it was a good thing, no, because that's it just, it's just a historical fact that men, males all tended to come first, so the coaches are all men, the administrators are all men, etc, etc, etc. So any female coming in is going to be the odd one out, or the odd two out, or am I overrunning? I don't know, I'm going to go on the last, I'll, I'll show up in a minute. <laughs> I've nearly finished. Um, the, so the problem for a, for a female coach coming in is there's all you lot sitting there acting male with testosterone leaking out all over the place and all that kind of thing. And if that, it's not that, so that, so the female coach may appear not to be tough enough. They may even burst into tears occasionally. They may worry about what other people are doing, be signing more new water. It doesn't mean they're a useless coach because their brain up here, the bit that analyzes badminton or right one of these, is just as good as, as the male. But that's the way it can come across. And they may be underconfident and have a lower opinion of themselves than others have of them. And that's a constant for female coaches, I think. Most female coaches, a lot of female coaches, underrate themselves compared with 
if you pair with a male coach, it is over, most over, male coaches overrate themselves. And that's just as bad. Well, the male thing is probably worse. So, should we coach women? <coughs> well, we kind of covered that, I think. I don't see any reason why they shouldn't. I don't see even if it's going to men should coach women, women should coach men. I don't, I don't see there's a gender problem. As long as there's enough support to allow intellect to triumph over emotion. <coughs> and that everyone understands that. So, the key is to recognise that different doesn't mean worse than. In any sense. And I've said, since most sport is male dominated, inevitably, women are likely to be in the minority, and therefore they're the ones who are different, because the majority are obviously the norm. If you see what I mean. Otherwise, sports restrict themselves to the females who instinctively act as males, which is about way in ten. Which is one of the reasons that the ratios are often wrong. That so we're relying on the females who happen to have more instinctive male reactions, and so there's fewer of them. The ones who tend to act female are insecure and won't put themselves forward and don't get into the sport and are knocked out of by stupid blokes. Or we force women to act around the problem and develop odd behaviours, unnatural behaviours, that's a bit weird, but you know what I mean. So behaviours that allow them to cope with blokes. Or they, are, or they start being lads, which is kind of... And there's, there is this pressure, isn't it? You know, female coach, female athlete. Oh, you can't be one of the lads. You'll be able to just be one of the lads. Well, perhaps you don't want to be one of the lads. And perhaps they shouldn't be one of the lads. Any work with the blokes, you know, if you blokes say, oh, come be one of the girls. Well, it's just as stupid, isn't it? And yet, he's like, oh, be one of the girls. So, and then, can males change? And what could females do? Because I'm not going to answer that question at all. Some blokes are beyond salvation, I think. Um, and, and so, it's a matter of education and all these kind of things. <coughs> so, just to finish off, I think it is disruptive to good decision making to be distracted or misled by male instinctive behaviour as it is by female instinctive. I don't see a difference. Men will take bad decisions based on their bad male emotions in the same way that females will take poor decisions based on their female emotions. The trick is to recognise both what they are, devise strategies that allow both genders to be maximally effective, and respect and understand and get the best out of each other. That's easy to say. I thought that when I was writing it. It's more difficult to do if you're not doing it. Australia, you'll see that it's not so much of a deal. 
and Australia's only been separated from the rest of the world for a couple of hundred years. So I, can't, I don't think, I don't think they've been, and, and, and that has not been, that's only been true in the last 20 years. So I think that's something, I, I think it's something we can change. But it's as important for boys as it is for girls. It's not, it's not that girls need to learn, it's that boys need to learn as well. And to, and to behave in a sensible way around. You know, it's, it's, a male, it's a male and a female problem, it's not just a female problem. And, it, and it's not that you have, you know, females have to chat with. 